In the last couple of videos when we were talking about confidence intervals, we needed to know the standard deviation of the entire population. And there are various ways to get this information, but a lot of times it's not available to us. We don't know enough about the population. That's why we have to do confidence intervals in the first place. So how do we find this standard deviation? It can be a little more difficult and it's not gonna be covered in this class. So what do we do if we don't know it? In this case, instead of the normal distribution, we're gonna use what's called the student's T distribution. And this is very, very similar to the normal distribution with a couple of minor differences. So it still has the same general shape of the, um, the normal distribution. It also has a mean of zero. It's also symmetric, so it looks very, very similar. It still has this general shape. The only difference is my standard deviation. Instead of being equal to one, is greater than one. So it just has a larger standard deviation. So the only difference is our standard deviation is no longer one. So how can we move to a confidence interval using this information? Well, we had a nice formula for the confidence intervals when we knew this population standard deviation. What about when we don't? This is our formula when we don't know the population standard deviation. On the left, x bar minus t of alpha over two times s over root n. On the right, we change that minus to a plus. So what do all of these letters mean? x bar is going to be our sample mean. This is something that we have already. S is our sample standard deviation. While we don't know the population standard deviation, we can find the sample standard deviation. N is the sample size. How big is our sample? And then finally, we have this T of alpha over two. Whenever we were dealing with our confidence intervals before, we had a Z instead of a T and we had set values for the z depending on the size of our confidence interval. The value of t will also depend on the level of confidence we have. Do we want a 95% interval, a 90% interval, etc.? And it's going to come from a table similar to the z table. So let's look at how to find this value t. Let's suppose we want a 95% confidence interval and we know our sample size is 22. When we find this value t, it's going to depend on those two pieces of data. What is, the uh, what is the confidence interval and what is the sample size? In reality for this, we're going to need what's called degrees of freedom, which is the sample size minus one. In this case, our degrees of freedom is 21. So let's move over to our t table and see if we can figure out this value. So here is our t table. And if I scroll to the bottom of this, you'll notice it says confidence level. I said we wanted a 95% confidence level, so we're going to be in this particular column right here. I also said the degrees of freedom mattered, and it was the sample size minus 1. That is this column on the right-hand side. So our sample size was 22, so our degrees of freedom is 21. Going over, our value for t is 2.080. So now I've been able to find this value of t. And this is how we need to do it for every problem. We need to know our confidence level. That's going to give us the number, the percentage across the bottom. And then along the side is our degrees of freedom. Depending on what your t table looks like, that confidence level that we looked up across the bottom may be at the top. But either way, we can find the appropriate confidence level and the appropriate degrees of freedom. As another one, very quickly, if we want to do a 95% confidence interval and our sample size is 220, this time our degrees of freedom will be 220 minus 1, which is 219. So let's go over to the t-table and see what happens. Coming back to my t-table, I still want this 95% level, but my degrees of freedom was 219. And you'll notice that's not in this column on the left-hand side. So instead, we do the largest possible thing that we can do that's still smaller. So we don't want to go up to 1,000 because 1,000 is bigger than 219. 
but the thing the closest one that's smaller is going to be 100. So our value would be this 1.984. Now that we're a little bit more comfortable with reading this table, let's actually try to do a confidence interval. So let's try a full example. Let's suppose that we found some new skeleton, fossil skeletons of a previously unknown species, and we want to know their average height of this species. From these fossil skeletons, we have learned that the average height of the skeletons was 46.14. We also know that the standard deviation of the skeletons was 1.19. And finally, we know that we only found seven possible skeletons of this. And let's suppose we want to do a 99% confidence interval. So I didn't write down the whole problem, but I wrote down all of the key points here. We know what the average height is, we know what the sample standard deviation is, we have our sample size, and we know our confidence level. The first thing we want to find is the margin of error. This value of t times s over root n. So remember the t value comes from our t table, so let's look it up. We know we have a 99% confidence interval, and we know our sample size is 7, which means our degrees of freedom is 6. So here's our t-table. We know we need a 99% confidence interval, and we know our degrees of freedom is 6, so if I go up to the 6, 3.707. There's our value of t. s is our standard deviation, 1.19, and n is our sample size, which is 7. So now we can calculate this value. And when we do, we get 1.67. So this is our margin of error. We now need to add and subtract this from our mean. So 46.14 minus 1.67 is less than the actual average, which is less than 46.14 plus 1.67. And working out that addition and subtraction problem, we have that the actual average height of this particular species is somewhere between 44.87 and 47.81. And we're 99% sure that we are right about that. Let's do one more. So let's suppose that we have a company that now can facture artificial sapphires. And we want to look at the average weight of these sapphires that they are producing. So we look at a trial run that they do, and out of 37 sapphires, we find their average weight and their standard deviation. We find that the average weight of these gems is 6.75 carats, and we find that the standard deviation of these 37 sapphires is 0.033 carats. And we want to do a 95% confidence interval. So let's start by finding our margin of error. We need to start by finding our value for t. Coming over to our t table, we know that we want a 95% confidence interval, and we know we have a total of 37 carats, so our degrees of freedom would be 36. You'll notice 36 is not on this particular table, so the smallest thing that's the closest is going to be 30, which gives us 2.042. Sticking that into our formula, s is 0.33 and n is 37. So now we just need to work this value out. And this gives us 0.11. We now add and subtract this from the mean. So 6.75 minus 0.011 is less than the actual mean, which is less than 6.75 plus 0.011. So the actual mean is going to be somewhere between 6.64 and 6.86 carats.